Okay. Um, welcome to this afternoon's session. And we're going to talk about roundabouts and accessibility. And my name is Robin Lewis. I'm one of the transportation engineers at the city of Bend in Oregon. And uh... hi, everyone. I am Chris Chang. I am, whoa, I sound really loud. Sorry, I'm not used to mics. Um, I'm the active transportation liaison for ODOT in Region 4, so I'm based in Bend, Oregon. Okay, everybody, I'm Charlene Wills. I am an advocate. Uh, uh, live in Bend, I've been there since the end of 2012. Went there to get away from the big city of Los Angeles to smell pine trees instead of car exhaust. <laughs> and since then, well, Bend has grown by leaps and bounds, but it also has improved uh, getting sidewalks and audible signals and things like that. There's also in uh, including roundabouts and roundabouts and disabilities don't necessarily mesh very well. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Yes, not yet. <laughs> And I'll jump in really quick. When we talk about roundabouts and multimodal and ADA access, we're going to be focusing mostly on visual impairments. So there's, you know, we've got one hour and there's a lot we could talk about yeah. about accessibility in general, but that'll be the focus today. So largely it's about, you know, Robin and I aren't experts in a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff, but roundabouts. <laughs> so really we're here to sort of highlight these lived experience of people. So I'm here to, glad to be sharing the stage with Charlene, so that way you can hear from her directly as well. And we'd love to hear from others as well, if people have comments to add. Yeah. So City of Bend, um, I started work in April of 2000. And when I first moved to town, the population was about 50,000. We surpassed 100,000. We're well on our way to 150,000. So we've been growing rapidly. Um, it, the tremendous pressures um, uh, to move people around and goods is, is intense. Um, we're poorly funded um, as far as our tax base. So we rely a lot on developers to improve our transportation system. And so as Charlene noted, um, it's piecemeal because of that. Uh, but one thing that we have um, embedded into our codes is roundabouts. And uh, as you can see, there's a map um, up on the screen and there are green dots and yellow dots. And there's probably should be a few dots that aren't on there, but the green dots represent roundabouts that Bend has built. They're operational, they're in service, and there's 47 of them. Um, when I first moved to town, we had one, and it, it had opened three months before I started, and it was built open to traffic in November of 1999. It was built by ODOT and a developer in partnership, and this developer um, was Brooks Resources, and they owned a lot of the west side of Bend. They were a timber industry company um, way back, and as the timber industry was dying, they owned a lot of land. So they turned to real estate development. And Mike Holleran was their um, chief executive officer, and he really, really did not want a traffic signal on the west side of Bend. And as he was developing a piece of property, he was working with ODOT and ODOT was incredibly insightful in helping him um, receive ODOT approval to get a roundabout. And at that time, it was the first roundabout on a state highway system. It was a district level highway. So it wasn't um, you know, like US 20 or US 97, but it was a district level highway. So he needed to get their permission, their buy-in. So he did a lot of research. He did a lot of presentations in Bend. Um, and then I got there and that was my job was to take it further and bring it into normalcy and create roundabouts as a normal intersection control device and not a one-off. 
Um, so my job was to go out and um, teach the engineers in town how to design them. We brought in experts. Um, we held work sessions and design sessions. I went to backyard barbecues, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, um, street fairs, uh, Fourth of July parties with my roundabout display and I had a 3D roundabout display and little cars and I would let everyone kind of get more comfortable with them. Um, the one group we didn't really interface with was the ADA community. Um, and so fast forward 23 years, um, I'm trying to play catch up on that. So we're in the process of revising our design guidelines. Um, so I've been spending some time with Charlene um, to try and help us learn and catch up. And I'll mention ODOT's also pretty supportive of the roundabouts there. You'll notice on the previous slide that they're not just on the city system, but you also see there's a few on the ODOT highway system as well. We have one already built. It's on the far east edge there at Ward Hamby. That's a single lane roundabout. <laughs> and We've got another three roundabouts coming in on the north end there, and those will be full double lane roundabouts as well. So we're supportive in that area as well, mostly along US 20, but there'll be nine, I think soon to be nine roundabouts right around the Bend area, including Sisters, Prineville, projects in the work there. So yeah. we're really implementing them all over. ODOT took a bit of a pause um, and worked with the freight industry. Um, and reset their standards and to try and get buy-in off the freight industry. Um, they had a bit of a moratorium for a few years, but that's been lifted. Um, so I put this um, prompt on here, why does Bend do roundabouts? And that was for you guys to help us um, just shout out reasons why communities might want to consider a roundabout. Slow traffic. Safety, slow traffic. Reduce waiting, reduce emissions, lower maintenance cost because of the electricity, place making, resilient. Yeah, so we, we really resounded with, in particular, the vision zero aspects of roundabouts. So, um, a, uh, FHWA has published a lot of studies, but we've also seen it in Bend that our crashes are fewer at our roundabouts. Um, our injury rates are lower. Our fatality rates are lower. Um, we did just recently have a fatality at a roundabout. It's probably one of a handful in the entire United States um, that we had that. But um, traffic signals have 10 times the number of fatal and serious injury crashes than roundabouts. Um, idling and emissions. When we talk about the smell of air in Bend, you get off the plane in Redmond, especially after a rain, it smells very piney and crisp. Um, so fewer emissions, fewer idling, that means better air quality. Um, so there's a lot of reasons we do them. Um, and they're safer by design. Um, and Chris can talk about this one and I can too, if you want. Um, sure, so this is what, uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, again, Mike's weird for me. Um, this is one of our single lane roundabouts that we put over there at Ward Hamby. So this is on the east side of town, just outside of town. But hopefully it looks a little different looks a little different than our typical roundabouts that you've seen. We've been experimenting <laughs> with, there you go. with some of these different ideas, but you can see on three of the legs, we've sort of pushed the path away there on the side. So hopefully create some clarity for people on multimodal access there. Eventually, you can see one corner where we didn't because there's a parking lot there, issues with right of way. So. This design is something I'm pretty excited about. It's an interesting spot because it's really outside of town, but town will be growing back in there at some point. Yeah. Oh. Huh. 
We'll just trade. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in this one, um, Chris has really been trying to get the city of Bend to do this, but we are always constrained by right of way. But these distances, um, and Charlene and I noticed this on one of the roundabouts we just did was this distance between the sidewalk and the ramp really helps with driver yielding. Um, and it allows anybody on a bike. So if you're in a bike lane, you can exit the roundabout um, and hop onto the Shoji's path. Um, you are now perpendicular to traffic. So some of the other safety features are by design. There's the bike ramp is about 100 feet from the roundabout. The crosswalk is about 25 to 30 feet from the roundabout and then the interface with traffic. So those three separations allow a driver to have a reduced burden on decision making. So the bike, are they on or off? The crosswalk, is there someone there or not? And then the yield line. And so that separates their thought process. It makes it easier and um, just makes decision making easier. Um, the roundabout shape slows drivers down. So our speeds and approach speeds are lower. Our, our um, driver yielding at roundabouts is at 98% in bend. Um, that's on our single lanes. It's great, right? Um, so some of the stuff Charlene will get to is she can't tell they've yielded. Um, but this one has external truck aprons, which helps keeps the speeds lower for most vehicles but allows that accommodation for freight. And that's some of the stuff that ODOT took that pause and reset and figured out. So our first roundabouts were not very um, forgiving for large vehicles. Um, so this slide says navigation. How does a person with a vision disability and blindness, blindness navigate? And so, Charlene, you can you can explain um, how how you get around and what are the clues that you're looking for. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I personally do not navigate roundabouts at all. Um, I never even knew what one was, except driving through them and it felt like to me like we were making a sort of s turn um, in and out but i had no concept of what it what a roundabout was what it did how i would navigate it as a pedestrian and the first time i was introduced to one was not with robin but with someone else um, and all i found at that point were barriers. There were little bollards along the sidewalk. There were little planters. I couldn't follow an edge um, very well. When I came to what I thought was a pedestrian crosswalk, no, it was for the bike lane, uh, the bike entrance in and out. And again, I still had absolutely no concept of what I was doing, what, how I was crossing. A friend of mine made a model for me, a tactile model of an, a roundabout. And even with that, it was very difficult to conceive of, of what it does and how I was to navigate it. And then when Robin and I went out, um, we did two different ones. One was a pretty simple one. And that one, I sort of understood at least what I should do. Um, the second one was a multi-use, a multi-lane, I think two-lane one, and I was hopeless. I had no idea what, what was going on. Uh, what I would suggest to people is that when you get to the crosswalk, you stand there and close your eyes and try to listen for traffic and uh, for when you think it's safe to cross. And you will probably find that you are inundated with surround sound, 
which is wonderful for music. It's not wonderful for trying to gauge traffic. When you cannot see and understand visually what is around you, you obviously depend on your other senses. And the most important sense for most of us is hearing. And if I'm standing at a straight street crossing, so I have traffic, say, paralleling me to my right, or traffic uh, going horizontally uh, in front of me, and there's a signal there, or even if there isn't a signal, you have very definite waves that you can listen to and hear. And, that, and that's basically how we learn to cross streets. Um, uh, if there's a signal and it happens to be audible, that's wonderful. But you really listen for the cross traffic so that when you hear traffic going with you or coming toward you parallel, you know that it is safe for you to cross the street. Now, obviously, there's going to be times when somebody runs a red light or they turn right in front of you or, you know, there's, a, there's always something. But on the whole, that's the way you, you hear. Um, but when you're at a roundabout crossing, there's no way to know that because the traffic isn't going straight one way and then straight another. It's going in circles and, and, and it's all around you. And so it's very, very hard to understand where you are. Then if you have a signal pole or a pole that has flashing lights, but it isn't beeping, there's no audible. No, you don't even know that that pole is there, that you should push the bu a button. Um, in Bend, unfortunately, most of our signal poles, certainly all the ones I know, are um, way back away from the crossing. They're back on the inside edge of the sidewalk, They're often surrounded by shrubs or or other debris that you can't get at them. A wheelchair would have a hard time getting to them. And then you have to turn, once you've pushed the button, if you know it's there, and find your way back to the truncated edge or the curb, whatever it is, and hope to heck that you are still going straight in the direction you need to go. Uh, with roundabouts, it's just made doubly or trebly more difficult. And so uh, for us, uh, it's, it's almost impossible. I, like I said, I, I, with, a, with a guide dog, you can sometimes train your dog to help you. We have uh, one lady who was working with Robin to show that too, that sometimes at a certain one, you can train the dog to find the correct way uh, but you would have to do it with each individual roundabout because they're not all the same. And just even approaching one, you might not even realize that, that you were approaching a roundabout. You're expecting to find a regular street crossing. And no, it's not that at all. And you'd be totally lost. Um, roundabouts are wonderful for traffic. Uh, they fit in beautifully with the slogan, the slower, safer bend. Um, but they really are not very safe for pedestrians. Um, I've been told that there are many fewer accidents with pedestrians uh, at roundabouts. And I would submit to you that at least as far as the disabled population and older folks, it's probably because most of them avoid the roundabouts altogether. Yep. Shirley. Do you mind explaining how you might use your cane to navigate around? I think this. You want to? Would you mind? Chris explain? asked me yeah. if um, to explain how uh, I would use a cane to to get around. Well, everybody has their own techniques with cane. Of course, mobility instructors teach you certain ways. In Bend, because the sidewalks are often. Um, 
uneven. They're often, uh, the inside edges may have drop-offs to sunken parking lots or whatever. I tend to try to use the outside edge of the sidewalk and follow my cane along that edge, um, sweeping it inward uh, to clear in front of me as well. But in order to keep straight on the sidewalk, I don't, tr I can't go down the middle of a sidewalk. You have to have some kind of landmark in order to keep straight. Otherwise, you you just won't. Now, blind people don't focus. We don't have the way to focus, say, on an object across the street or along a sidewalk. Um, we have to have some sort of either audible landmark or tactile landmark in order to keep a straight line. And so I will take the use the cane and um, check the, the curb on the outside because it tends to be less uh, obstructed by poles or whatever. Um, the only time it would be useful to have a pole in the way is if the signal poles were set flush with the curb um, and especially very close to the crosswalk or right next to it, depending. Um, but that's how we how I do it. And then again, if if I use the cane to follow on a roundabout, it's not going to take me to a straight edge of a, a, a ninety degree edge is going to be going round and round and, and and I might find the truncated dome for a crossing but I'm not sure it's going to be for the pedestrian crossing or for bikes um, or <laughs> some other something and and again you have to you have to have some kind of idea in your head of what this looks like and if you don't then good luck yeah and charlene touched on it a little bit uh traffic signals have a lot of the same issues um these are our downtown signals on the photo on the left there's no locator tone because there's no push buttons right it's you get a walk signal because it's programmed in they're not audible so downtown the the nice benefit is that sidewalk aims you right to the ADA ramp, right? So it, it does have that visual and tactile clue that you have arrived at an intersection. And then as Charlene said, there's traffic noise. So if traffic is crossing in front of her, she knows she's arrived at an intersection. Um, there's the truncated domes. So in Bend, we're really good at our ADA ramps and our truncated domes. Um, so so she has a lot of clues, even though she doesn't have a push button and no other audible um, that says walk sign is on because it's not an audible signal in downtown Bend. Um, no, she mentioned if you look on the image on the right, if you're using that outside edge along the grass to walk around a roundabout, there's no indication at all there's even a ramp there on the left. There's no way to find that. You know, right. it's, a shared use path it's almost 12 feet across so your cane is not sweeping that far and if there was a push button like if this was multi-lane even if that was pointing towards it now you have to do a 90 degree orientation and try to get a line across that 12 feet to find this narrow opening yeah not only just to the ada ramp but also all the way across the street yeah so um the f back up oh uh, sorry I don't know this button. Okay, um, so here is this inside edge. This is the edge that Charlene uses um, when she's using a uh, cane. Um, so she does have a little bit of investigation to try and figure out if this is the bike ramp. Um, this is the near edge of the bike ramp coming on from the road. Um, the clear uh, caneable difference between material in this park strip is really important. Don't pave that. A lot of times agencies, mine in particular, wants to pave that because it's less maintenance, right? But then it's not detectable at all, right? So, so having this gravel here um, and a little bit of a landscape strip is helpful. She can find this, this edge of the ADA ramp um, and she can find the truncated domes. 
And then once she's at the truncated domes, she turns ter perpendicular to traffic and she can't hear a yield. So um, like I said, 98% yield rates in bend, pretty much everyone stops. She can't hear that they've stopped because there's no auditory in input for her. Um, all she can hear is the circulating traffic. So she's not quite sure what's going on. Um, this photo on the right is interesting in another way in that this is Nancy and she she was using um, a guide dog. And so we went out on a trip. She had a guide dog. Her guide dog took her right around the intersection and I had to go chase her She because the dog didn't find the ADA ramp because there wasn't an, a tactile clue within that sidewalk system yeah. for her to turn. It, you, you have to teach the dog where to, to go where to go and usually uh, the dogs will learn it pretty quickly uh, if you do it two or three times but again you would have to teach it at every single roundabout as if it were brand new and they'd never had it before because um uh, the, uh, roundabouts are different and the and the and the uh, crosswalks are located at different uh, positions and so on whereas with a straight street crossing it's pretty simple. You come to the curb. Um, if you're lucky, your signal pole is on your left or your right, right beside you. Um, and it may or may not be audible. That's not really so important. But you know that you're going to, uh, that if you are at the curb and the dogs are taught to stop at the curb and right at the curb um, and to face you in the correct position so that you don't cut a corner across the street. Uh, sometimes you do anyway. <laughs> yeah, those, but that's those... different. Um, but you you have a sense of, OK, if I step off and I keep going as straight as I understand straight to be, I'm going to reach the other side of the street. But you do not have that with the with the roundabouts, at least not the ones that I've experienced. The single lane ones are a little easier, especially if there is a bike lane that is noticeable that you can cross before you get to the actual road. Um, and I found that using uh, having that bike lane there and then crossing the road, then crossing the other bike lane and getting to the sidewalk was easier, even though it seemed to be a little wider, but you were in the street less yeah no that's exactly right um so this is a, tr a photo of a traffic signal in bend it's a multi-lane traffic signal and it has almost all of the same issues that charlene's experiencing at the roundabout so this sidewalk here comes around um there's no clue that there's an intersection there's there's no information within the sidewalk that if you turn perpendicular you're going to find the ada ramp so she has to find that corner and that intersection um, some of the other difficulties is um, this is a right turn bypass lane so very common treatment at a, tra at a traffic signal that has busy um, busy traffic um, but often in oregon the right turn bypass lane is outside of the traffic signal. It's controlled by a yield sign or a stop sign or not controlled at all. So there's no information for her to get to that island. Um, so, so she doesn't know it's perpendicular. There's no push button. There's no arrow telling her perpendicular. So she does have the truncated domes and that's it. So now once she's on the island, now she's got to find either one of these ADA ramps and the push buttons they're actually in a good spot they have locator tones so she can once she's on the island she can find those right um but if you look at these these crossings they're really long so this is a five lane road um, in all directions so these crossings um are also not great because they have um what's called those diagonal ramps and so if you were to step off and kind of follow the truncated domes, they wouldn't be aiming you towards that island that she has to find. They're aiming you to the middle of the intersection. Um, so, and sometimes when they're on a skew like this, 
Um, so she takes off from this ramp. She's most likely queuing into perpendicular traffic. So she's hearing traffic. She's trying to walk parallel to that moving traffic as she's moving. But the, the crosswalk is skewed from that. And so there's no way to keep oriented to, to, the, um, to the ramp that she's trying to locate. So these issues exist at roundabouts almost universally, but they exist at a lot of traffic signals as well. Now, one of the uh, best ways to help with this um, is to make sure that there are flashing audible signals, at least the flashing, uh, the, the lights are flashing. Um, usually the thing says, but traffic may not stop. Well, that's not nice, but at, <laughs> at least you, you have something um, to have beep, some sort of beeping tones that you can at least hear that will orient you hopefully toward the, where you need to cross. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing would be to have some kind of tactile uh, line in, in the crosswalk itself all the way across that a cane tip or your foot could follow, that sort of thing. Um, it would be also helpful to have at least one edge, the, preferably the outside edge of the sidewalk, clear of any other uh, scenic things uh, like, like little planters or whatever else, um, so that you could at least uh, follow that edge and know that that's the outside of, of, and the edge that you eventually want to use to cross the street. Um, I have been told that older people also are hesitant to use roundabouts because they too have difficulty sort of grasping where the things are leading and, and how to get across to where they want to go. If they still have a lot of vision and can see the other side of the street or the signage, that's one thing. But uh, those who use walkers, um, uh, don't like them. I have a friend who uses a, a, a power wheelchair and she can see perfectly well and was a driver for years and years, but she also doesn't like to try roundabouts. I'm not quite sure why. Perhaps sometime our folks who use wheelchairs could discuss that, but um, uh, she has told me that, that she won't use roundabouts if she can help it. And then on this one, I'll add for the agency folks, as you look at this, you think about the tools that we have to help with that navigation, audible signal is probably the biggest one, but how do we balance that, you know, it's almost 90, 100 feet across this intersection, super high volumes, the speed's transitioning from 35 to soon to be 55 outside of town, so how do we make that audible enough to overcome that sound of, what is it, almost 30,000 vehicles? through this intersection yeah. in one direction, yeah. probably so, another 30. So. Yeah, so um, anyone crossing this as a pedestrian, they've got to um, wait for their turn. Okay, that's okay. We can get them to the corner, possibly. Um, they get a signal, um, but cars can turn right across them. Cars can turn left across them, and they have to walk across five lanes. Um, so there's a lot of conflicts that are built into a traffic signal crosswalk that a pedestrian has to know about. And if you're unsighted, that's a really tough task. Um, so even at our traffic signals, I would um, posit that our crashes indicate that permitted turning movements across the ped phase are the main cause of crashes at intersections. So even at our traffic signals, um, it might feel more accessible because they get told to go, but it's physically gonna have a lot of conflicts. Um, so at the roundabout, um, like Charlene said, there's no phase. So it's not like she has a very clear chance of, hey, this is my turn. Um, 
So, and, and sometimes all, all roundabouts have a, have a refuge in the middle. So you only have to, to cross one lane of traffic at a time, moving in one direction, get to the middle and then cross the other direction. So it does make it easier um, in that way, but it's, it is harder to detect the sound and auditory clues that Charlene's getting. Um, and at these larger roundabouts, the position of the splitter island is back enough that there's deflection within the splitter island. So this photo shows um, uh, the larger islands. So there's plenty of room to put a bike, a bike with a trailer, a group of humans, um, but there's an inflection point at the roundabout. And so if Charlene's walking and she finds the crosswalk um, and she crosses to the middle, this green line shows that there is an inflection point that she is walking on the outside of. Um, that's often very difficult to detect. So if she um, was just to go straight and not find that deflection point, she would end up in a location that doesn't have a receive ramp. Um, she's walking on the inside of the crosswalk it's easy to find that deflection point because it's on the inside of her turn she'll walk right into it which forces her to go this way so the trick is to have these narrow enough that this green line if it went straight wouldn't miss and so that's a really really tricky thing so in bend our standard is to have a straight crosswalk with no deflection points but it's not always possible um, so then it becomes even more tricky just to get that um, so here's some, this is the one that Charlene hated the most. Um, it's 27th and Butler, it's, it's a full two by two roundabout. So it, we put in um, our RFBs, but like all our RFB signals in Bend, none of them have the locator tone turned on. Um, so we get her there and I'm like, oh no she's not going to be able to find this pole so it's way oops i'll go back um it's way back at the back of the sidewalk um this is like chris said this is a 12 foot path so the the ped push button is at the back of 12 feet and then it's got a great arrow that points her right to the ada ramp but now it's two lanes across so a little more complicated um and then there is our RFBs in the middle that are easy to find. So this one's like, it'd say get us a C minus for not having the locator tones on. Um, this one was great because um, often when we're fitting a roundabout into a very um, tight area, we'll use um, mountable splitter islands, mountable areas for the trucks. So the photo on the left has what we're calling a mountable splitter island. So that enables the truck to navigate and use some of that space, keep the speed slow by having um, not such a wide um, turning movement. But both Charlene, um, who is using a cane, and Nancy, who is using a guide dog, missed it. So like Charlene said, sometimes it's, it's not always perfectly um, straight lines that they walk in, right? So they missed this, they walked right up onto that very flat splitter island um, and then weren't sure where the crosswalk was, where did it go? Um, the photo on the right shows a barrier curb. So they're within that splitter island and they could cane the edges of it. They didn't step up on it, they could find their way through it. So there's this um, balancing act between making sure we can fit freight through and making sure that someone with a cane can detect it or even the dog, because the dog walked right up onto it too. This was the one Charlene liked the most because it had that distance. Um, this is uh, the city's first protected bike roundabout. So it's a protected channel um, for the bike on the main arterial. Um, there's a couple out here that just have um, delineators or some bollards, but ours ours is actually a channelized um, facility. And there, as you approach the roundabout, the bike goes right into its own channel. Um, and the ADA ramp is 
uh, you know, on the sidewalk edge. The other clue we did here was we lowered the sidewalk. So as Charlene comes down, she can feel that, you know, there's there's a lowering. It's easier to find this set of truncated domes because there's a clue that there is actually a ramp there. Um, so the distance between uh, the truncated domes and the actual crosswalk goes through the bike lane and goes through the island. And so she, that that whole distance she was walking there, um, it was easier for a car to give a yield because they had that time. As she's approaching the the crossing, um, the vehicle was was uh, reacting to her and slowing down. You know, say that similar concept of the first roundabout that we saw at Ward Hamby, hence the longer that straight walking go, I don't know, yeah. can go back, but you can see it makes it clear that people are walking to go to the crosswalk rather than, you know, it being right at that and then a sharp 90 degree, four feet, six feet to that crossing. It gives drivers more time to yield or recognize that people are crossing. So here's some other things. So in addition to lowering the, the sidewalk panel um, on the circulatory side um, so that it's easier to find the truncated domes, um, ODOT has done a couple of experiments with um, a transverse detectable panel so that you can, um, you can find it. It kind of identifies that here's the ADA ramp and you can get it. We saw that at the Blumenauer Bridge. If you guys went over that, they've got that whole channel um, that gets you off the bridge onto the ADA ramp. So it's, it's really easy. Um, interestingly, it's not, it's not as caneable as it is um, underfoot. Mm -hmm. So she could follow it underfoot um, but it, it was, I think it has to be less than a quarter inch profile um, in order to meet the wheelchair needs. Um, yeah. The, the, the thing is, um, you use the cane basically to make sure there's uh, nothing, uh, the, there's not an obstacle of some kind, uh, a hole. You hope you won't just travel over and, and miss and then step in anyway, but. Uh, you use the cane basically to clear obstacles, but you also use your feet to feel the ground exactly that's underneath you. I um, use a particular crack in my driveway at home to keep myself straight on the path leading off my complex. Um, when that's covered with snow or ice, and um, I have a little more difficulty because, again, you cannot focus visually on something to keep you in a straight line. It's one reason that uh, folks who have been drinking too much can't follow a white line or whatever the cops put out there. Um, because they can't, they can't focus. They're, they're, and, and we don't have that ability. Um, we use hearing, which is a different sense, and it, it helps to focus. Um, and if we have a specific beep, beep, beep tone from a signal that we can hear from across the street, and it's not being interfered with, but, with other beep, beep, beep tones from other directions, then we can zone in on that. Or if there's uh, a certain, oh, I don't know, some other audible something um, that is directly across the street, you can always use that if you're able to hear. And that helps to keep you on the straight line. But it, it's and it is really the most important thing for any crossing is if you can have a, some sort of audible signal, but it does also help if you can have a heavy duty painted line to follow uh, with your cane or your foot. Um, of course, there are cars that will go over that line or it's covered in snow or debris, but 
anything like that tactically is useful. Um, or the, the ridge thing that we followed on the bridge that Robin indicated. Um, so there are things that can be done uh, to help with, with all this. Um, and I would encourage those who are doing roundabouts since they have been known to be helpful to slow down traffic and, and whatever to, to utilize as best you can signage. Um, it, it would be nice actually to know that, I, that it's a roundabout I'm coming to if I'm in a strange place like Portland. I don't know Portland at all and I'm still willing to come here alone and, and try to work things out. But it'd be nice to know if I push the button that says you are at a roundabout, uh, you are going to, uh, this one, you are going to cross such and such, you know, whatever. Um, uh, there's all sorts of things like that, that that can help with this. Data input would be great. Hold on, stay on this one really quick. So okay. I just wanted to point out this is, some things we've been involving as well. So the image on the right with those tactile, longitudinal tactile ones, we started using that to mitigate. We've updated our standards recently, so that helps mitigate a problem that was brought up earlier. But the bike ramps look very similar to a curb ramp, so dogs, canes. So we've started using longitudinal delineators like this to sort of mitigate that problem to identify it's a bike ramp rather than the ADA ramp itself. And then putting on my ODOT hat, the image on the left, that is not something that's approved that we've done. This is something we've explored to sort of help mitigate some of these situations where if you look at the push button, it points you at a ramp, which really directs you into the center of the intersection. So to help potentially mitigate some of these problems of you know not being able to find the ADA ramp from the push button and then getting across from the ADA ramp to the far side is potentially exploring putting longitudinal ones from the push button that identify where the ramp is so you can make it across the shared use path, but then potentially also continuing that so you can see a pointed line to the next ADA ramp across the intersection rather than the direction of the ADA ramp, which is towards the center of it. So. Yeah, there's a lot of clues here that tell you to go the wrong way. Yeah. So, so. the there's um, this arrow that's the main you know orientation arrow. So you've pushed the button, you've heard it, um, it points you that way, and then these curbs point you in the wrong direction as well. The truncated domes point you in the wrong direction. So something to get you in the right way. This is just one idea. Um, the other thing that is allowed by the MUTCD is to have a beacon at the far side that you can home home in on. Um, we don't know of any in Oregon. They're allowed, but I, we don't have any. So um, I'm working with ODOT Region 4 to try and see if we can get one, at least at the traffic signal near um, Charlene's house. And again, one more caveat, but Again, we're talking about visual disabilities. So how do we do this without say impacting wheelchairs, right? As we start putting longitudinal things, how do we stop that from being a barrier for people on walkers, for people in mobility devices, for people in wheelchairs? So a lot of conversations happening here don't have the right answer, we don't. but we're exploring how you balance these. Yeah, so um, there's just a couple of images up here. Um, the one on the left, that's the a series of something in the um, sidewalk system that would tell you there's an ADA ramp off to your left or right. Um, and then this is a common practice that we use now is to sync the, the crosswalk landing pad so that you know you've arrived at the landing pad and then you can turn and hit the ADA ramp. Um, and also just having someone go out with you and help narrate what's going on is also helpful. So this was a city councilor, um, Anthony Broadman, um, with Charlene at a multi-lane roundabout. And he's, he's telling her that someone has yielded, because otherwise there's no clue. Um, uh, a county in Detroit, Michigan, is I can't think of the name of the county, which is mortifying. Um, is experimenting with sound so that um, away from the crosswalk, they'll have uh, longitudinal um, rumble bars 
And so as vehicles go over the rumble bars, um, Charlene can hear them, but if they are not going over, that means she's gotten a yield, right? So um, they're experimenting with some additional auditory clues um, that would help. And we have this in accessible format. If you want it, let us know. Um, and I'll mention one quick thing at the end here, but the most important thing I think is really just, especially for us agency folk, is to really meet people out where they are, right? Like get out on site with people. I never would have known about the angled splitter island being a problem until Robin had gone out with Nancy and Charlene and ended up on the middle, right? We put that in there for a reason of angling people towards traffic, but that's designing for people who can see that coming up versus yeah. it becoming a trap for people with a dog, with a cane. So really it's about getting out there. Yeah, and just getting out with more folks that have this disability um, and uh, trying to get them more comfortable with roundabouts. We have a lot of them. So that's a lot of our transportation network that they're not feeling comfortable at. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're improving that, um, change our standards and then go back and retrofit. Um, so one sidewalk Charlene found for us, um, the, the crosswalk led to a sidewalk, which led right back to the bike ramp. And you actually had to jog to get to the real sidewalk, um, but there was no way to know that. So um, she helped me find that and the crew is out there this spring fixing it. So, but that was two summers ago when we found that one, Charlene. So it did take us a couple of years to get the budget and the time on the crew schedule to get it fixed. So, but advocacy does work. Um, it's a big ship to turn, but we'll, we'll get it, we'll get it turned. Any questions? Oh, I always have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, it's Mary Lee, and uh, I'm a lifelong pedestrian blind traveler all over the country. And uh, the thing that I really encourage you to keep in mind as much as possible is Consistency is our friend, okay? Consistency is our friend. <clears throat> it's very important that, uh, you know, I know you need space to experiment. So, you know, the, the earlier in the process you get people with disabilities involved, um, the better the results will be for everybody. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> kind of to tie into that, um, you know, we've been looking at where we have shared bike ped and then bikes leaving. We have ramps down to the roadway for, and we've been talking about these other options for tactile, but there isn't any standards out there really for using these longitudinal tactile um there's so many varieties like who you manufacture you guys are experimenting with it and that goes back to that consistency you know you want to try it in one area but is it going to work or is it there are going to be new standards that come out and we're going to have to go out and change it um you get different messages from the community of like, no, we don't want something at a bike ramp. Yes, we want something at a bike ramp. Um, how, do you, how do you kind of navigate in that, that gray area where you don't have clear, what's, what's there now, the guidance isn't enough, but, but there isn't enough new things coming to say, yeah, this is what you should do. Yeah, and I think, um we've bounced around on a lot of different ideas in Bend. Our bike ramps have a different shape nowadays. Um, and we never put a truncated dome on them. So if you're tactically trying to figure that out, you know you haven't found the ADA ramp because it doesn't have the truncated dome on it. And I think early guidance back in early 2000 did tell you to put an ADA ramp, uh, truncated dome on it. So um, we've taken all of those out for us um, just to have that consistency of 
um, that and then our angles are different. So an ADA ramp is always perpendicular, um, where the bike ramp is at a really acute angle. So you can cane around and you can detect that. Um, but it does take time, right? So um, anyone navigating with a cane has to has to kind of investigate if it's a driveway apron, um, is it a bike ramp, is it a um, fire hydrant um, concrete pad, is it the ADA ramp? And so there's just a lot of stuff that um, is tedious. And it would be nice if every time it was the ADA ramp, that panel, that landing panel was different and gave you a stronger message. I'll jump in really quick. As much as we would like everything to be consistent, like roundabouts, intersections, unfortunately with infrastructure, every single one is completely unique. So it's hard to, we can't just copy and paste it there with everything going on. So in terms of how do we address some of these things, we don't have a great standard yet. That's something, a conversation for us to continue, but I'll make a pitch for my counterpart, Jenna Berman had a conversation yesterday about our ODOT CQCR program. So that if there's a specific spot or issue that we can help address for like individual people, we can do that at those areas to experiment and or to help address, say if Charlene had a particular place she's going to regularly, then we can try some of these things. Hello, uh, I'm Kirk Paulson, uh, transportation engineer with parametrics. Um, this question is for Chris or maybe Robin. Uh, I'm curious about the uh, what you are planning for in the future with regard to the proposed ADA standards that will hopefully become adopted in the near future, um, specific to multi-lane roundabouts with multi-lane approaches where the language is um, expected to require a pedestrian indication, so more than a RRFB. Um, I, saw in your presentation you've got rfbs at the multi-lanes and so is your plan to provide like a php pedestrian hybrid beacon or fully signalize those crossings to make them accessible um, just curious how that conversation is playing about in odot or the city jurisdiction thank you I would defer to Gary over there. I, I, haven't, I haven't been part of those conversations in terms of how that signalized. I don't know if Gary wants to answer or if he's been involved in it. Sorry, sorry to put you on the spot, Gary. Kirk, I was gonna ask the same question. <laughs> no, my, my quick answer is, is we haven't seen what's gonna be in PROAG, or I mean, it's been proposed, but it might change when it comes out, but... Um, yeah, I think there's still a question of how, how helpful are the RFBs, you know, to a blind person. Yeah, maybe a PHB would be better since there's a, a, a solid indication for that. Yeah, a red indication. Yes. Yeah, I think the messaging um, has recently been updated because it did used to say, as Charlie noted, traffic may not stop, which is not a comforting message. <laughs> so, um, even even now we don't say that um, um, but i don't think we've addressed all of our messagings um, we haven't upgrade updated the recordings i'm rob interfell with city of eugene i have three questions and i'll try to make them brief oh i missed it did you say why you don't have the audible turned on in your rrfbs no okay i, th I think the inspectors just missed it got it so is that in general because it's in our be... standards okay secondly um, well, I, I'll just say in Eugene, we're considering for some multi-lane roundabouts, we're considering raised crosswalks. So I'm curious if that's something you've considered in Bend. And then thirdly, Chris talked about, you know, bringing people who are visually impaired out to the roundabouts to experience it and see what you, how you can improve them. But how about if you were designing from scratch, how would you design, how would you involve those folks in that? Would you build like tactical, mo tac tactical is not the right word, um, mm -hmm. models that they could feel or like how, you know, how would you involve? people in the design and then also have you thought about raised crosswalks you want to answer the raised crosswalk um, we haven't talked about raised crosswalks very much um, I think they would be a great tool um, so that same experiment um, in Michigan that used the audible longitudinal rumble bars they also did some raised crosswalks and both of those treatments improved the understanding of a yield from a driver on individuals that didn't have sight so they were good tools. We haven't implemented them in Bend. Um, 
it, it just complicates a little bit of the drainage um, and the truck flow for and us. Really quick, because I think we're out of time, but if I was designing from scratch, that's a difficult conversation. I'd have to really start engaging and figuring out which ones work well for the people in the area there, right? Like reaching out to Charlene or other people who are using those or will be using those. But you know, like all engineers and agencies, we have standards, we have practices there. It's not like we can just th experiment with whatever we want there. They need to be approved. So it's having those conversations so we can try to design around it as soon as possible or else get approvals to figure out what works for the users there. Thank you. I think we're. Thank, thank you guys you. so much. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Chris, Charlene, and um, Robin. Thank you. Um, the next presentation will be at 3.30. So there's coffee, some snacks, and then we'll see you here at 3.30.